Could it be today? We hope so. Uh, before the end of this hour, perhaps. Uh, this is part three of our study of a pre-tribulational rapture. And uh, we'll look at the road map again up here on the screen. And I want you to see kind of where we've been, just as a reminder. We made some initial considerations. I'm only going to remind you of one of them. And that is the doctrine of the rapture requires um, understanding at the detail level of many passages of Scripture. It is perhaps akin to a study of the Trinity, where there may not be one single proof text that says everything that needs to be said for a fully orbed understanding. And yet that does not make the doctrine untrue or unbiblical. It just takes some work. So again, that initial consideration is we just have humility and patience with one another, recognizing there are a number of views out there amongst believers, brothers and sisters in Christ, who love the truth, who love Christ, who long for his return, and don't necessarily agree on all of the details. So uh, just a reminder of humility in that. This is not one of those doctrines that if misbelieved, keeps one out of heaven. Uh, the, the truth is Jesus will do exactly what he has promised to do, and he will take all his people with him, regardless of how well they worked out their various doctrinal positions. We looked then at what is the rapture, and again, we'll put the chart up there for the pre-tribulational rapture. This is the view the elders of Grace Bible Church teach. This is what we believe, that the church is removed from the earth prior to the tribulation period, the 70th week of Daniel. And the church is removed with the dead in Christ preceding those who are alive and remain. And we will meet the Lord in the air. We will be transformed in the twinkling of an eye. And in the words of John 14, we will go to be with him where he is in the places prepared by him in his father's house. And so the church departs the world during the tribulation period and then returns with Christ in Revelation 19 and his return to the earth where he then ways laced, ways laced, I don't even know what that means, lays waste to his enemies and establishes his thousand year kingdom on the earth and we will reign with him during that time. That millennial kingdom will then give way to the eternal state uh, where there will be no sin, no curse, no sorrow, no death. The old things will have passed. And so uh, that, is the, that is the view we are upholding. Uh, the rapture is the removal, the snatching away and the immediate transformation. Uh, we'll call the rapture event the resurrection rapture event. Again, if you didn't find the word rapture in your Bible, uh, that is the Latin word raptura, which translates the Greek word harpazo. Uh, so if you want to call this the harpazoing uh, or the snatching away, it is right there in 1 Thessalonians 4. That is the view that we are putting forward. We looked next at the timing of the rapture and the various views of the timing of the rapture. We looked at the primary texts. There are three primary texts for the rapture we looked at. And then secondary texts. There are a whole host of other passages that agree with those primary texts. Uh, we discovered that there are not passages that disagree with those primary texts. And then we began looking at some indications Again, these are not necessarily proofs, but indications that those primary texts are consistent with the rest of Scripture. And the first indication that we looked at uh, was the presence of the church in the book of Revelation. Do you remember some 20 times in the book of Revelation the word ecclesia is used, but never during the tribulation period, never in 4 through 18 does the church show up, never is the, church, the word church used again until Revelation 22, a reminder that Jesus had written the entire book of Revelation to those seven churches in Asia Minor. Uh, so conspicuously absent from every tribulation text in the Bible, Old Testament, Olivet Discourses in the, in the gospel narratives, as well as the great tribulation passage of the book of Revelation, uh, the church is not there. That's an interesting indication. Next, we looked at the doctrine of the imminency of Christ, the reality that Christ could come back for his church at any time. This was a New Testament doctrine. It was held by the early church fathers. It was lost in the fourth century and is recovered in a right understanding of eschatology, uh, but there are only a couple of views that can uphold the doctrine of imminency. And we walked through those views and, and why the doctrine of imminency is ruined by some of the other views. 
Again, that's an indication. A third indication, and where we'll pick up the discussion this morning, um, is the indication, what is the third one? Where are we in the notes here? The purpose of the tribulation. Thank you, Wendy. A third indication that we're looking at, again, this is not a proof text as much as uh, a discovery of what the tribulation period is, what is its purpose, and who are its participants throughout the scriptures. And there is a consistency here. I will suggest to you that the purpose of the tribulation is the judgment of unrepentant nations and the preparation of unrepentant Israel. And the participants of the tribulation consistently throughout the scriptures are the unrepentant nations of the earth and the nation of Israel. So that's the indication we'll pick up our discussion with here this morning. What is the purpose of the tribulation? Well, there are several indicated in Scripture, and I would say, first of all, the purpose of the tribulation period is to judge the nations. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And Paul is giving the Thessalonian believers some comfort as it relates to their persecutors. The Thessalonian believers had been afflicted by various persecutions, and God says he will make everything right. Believers will be vindicated when God himself is vindicated. And this was intended to be a comfort to God's people. Listen to verse 7. To give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution. What is that event? That is the Revelation 19 event of Jesus coming with his holy angels to the earth in judgment. And he will deal out retribution, verse 8, to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And these will go on to pay the penalty of eternal destruction. So God will pour out his wrath on an unbelieving world and then usher those unbelievers into eternal destruction. So one of the purposes of this period, the period of Jesus coming physically to the earth with holy angels in flames of fire, is to judge the earth. In fact, the guy with the sandwich board uh, at the football stadium who says, the end is near, you know, repent. That guy's right. That day is coming. And it's coming in in judgment with the Lord Jesus. That is one of the purposes of that period. Listen to Zephaniah chapter 3. And Omri Miles preached on this text uh, a few weeks back. I want to remind you of two verses here. This will get actually at two of the stated biblical purposes for the tribulation period. Listen to verse 8 of Zephaniah 3. Therefore wait for me, declares Yahweh, for the day when I rise up as a witness... Indeed, my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, and pour out on them my indignation, all my burning anger, for all the earth will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. Okay, you, you see God's purpose there in this period, this tribulation period, is designed to gather all the nations together for judgment, and God will pour out his Wrath. That leads to a second purpose of the tribulation, and the second purpose is to refine and purge and regenerate Israel. Listen to the next verse in Zephaniah 3, verse 9. For then I will give to the people's purified lips that all of them may call on the name of Yahweh to serve him shoulder to shoulder. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, my dispersed ones, will bring my offerings. In that same day, they will feel no shame because of all your deeds which you have rebelled against me. Then I will remove from your midst your proud, exulting ones, and you will never again be haughty on my holy mountain. And listen to verse 12. I will leave among you a humble and lowly people. They will take refuge in the name of Yahweh. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong and tell no lies. Listen, that is an outstanding promise of the Bible that has never yet been fulfilled. And it is the purpose of this tribulation period described in Zephaniah 3 to bring that end about, to bring unrepentant Israel unto repentance. Not only to gather the nations to judge them, but to bring unrepentant Israel to a place of humility and gospel faith. Zechariah describes this same thing in Zechariah 13. 
Listen to verse eight. This is a sobering description of this time period. It will come about in the land, declares Yahweh, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish, but the third will be left in it. And I will bring that third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name. I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, Yahweh is my God. Speaking of Israel here, God says he will kill off two-thirds of the nation, and the remaining third will believe and call on the name of Yahweh. What is the purpose of the tribulation, according to Zechariah 3? To bring about this purification, a refining, a destruction of unrepentant Israel, and a salvation of a remnant, a large remnant, a third of the nation. And, and that is the way in which during the great tribulation, Romans eleven twenty seven 27 is fulfilled, that all Israel shall be saved. In other words, every single Israelite in remaining in that time period, uh, rescued from God's judgment and given a new heart to call on the name of Yahweh, the whole nation will be saved. Every Jew during that time period <laughs> will believe in Jesus, the Messiah. That is what Zechariah promises. Look back at Zechariah 12. In that day, Yahweh will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. In that day, God will set out to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And then in verse 10, Yahweh says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. So they will look on me whom they have pierced and mourn for him as for an only son. This is the morning of repentance and faith and gospel belief. This is the moment when Israel will actually sing Isaiah 53 as their song. If you follow the pronouns in that marvelous chapter, you discover that is a song of Israel. And it will only be sung when they look back on Messiah whom they crucified and they say, who has believed our report? No, he was crushed for our iniquities. They will sing that song in repentance, in accord with Zechariah 12.10 and Zechariah 13. This is God's purpose for the tribulation. There are many texts to, to look at the tribulation period in the Old Testament. I will give you the label for this period from Jeremiah chapter 30, and then we'll move on. I had hoped to cover everything related to the pre-tribulational rapture in three weeks. I'm confessing my shortcomings, even now. We're not going to get to all of it. But listen to this label. Alas, for that day is great, there is none like it, and it is the time of Jacob's trouble, or Jacob's distress. Jacob, the shorthand name for Israel. What does God call that great day? That, that period of, of troubling, that period of distress. It is Jacob's trouble. It is a time for Israel. It is a time for Israel's purification. This is in keeping with a, a third purpose for the tribulation, and that is the fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. And if you remember back to our study of the book of Daniel we did on Sunday nights last year, in Daniel chapter 9, we came to this monumental passage describing God's unfolding of future events. And in verse 20, he says, I was confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before Yahweh my God on behalf of the holy mountain of God. And then down in verse 24, God reveals this, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city. Who has Daniel been talking about? The nation of Israel. In her unrepentance. And God says 70 weeks have been decreed for that people, same people, not for the church, not for the world, but for Israel. To do what? Uh, six points here, to finish the transgression, uh, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Seven plus 62 equals 69. 69 from 70 equals one. In other, in other words, there's one week left, and that is a week. The word for week is just a seven, literally the word seven. It, there is one grouping of sevens left. 
One grouping of seven years is clear. When you do the math from Daniel chapter 9, the 69 weeks led right up to the triumphal entry of Christ, down to the day, leaving one grouping of seven years left. And then Daniel says, after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war and desolations that are determined. And there you discover that there is this gap between the 69 weeks and the one week, the gap between the 69 sevens of years and the last seven of years, because a lot of events have to happen between the 69 and the one. And then we discover this, he speaking of the Antichrist, will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. On the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. And in accordance with everything Daniel would would say throughout his prophetic section of his book about the Antichrist, that one will stand up as the abomination of desolations in the middle of that last seven So at the three and a half year point, he will stand in a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, declare himself to be God, demand the world worship him, and usher in the last half of the tribulation period, or what is called the great tribulation, leading up to the return of Christ. All of this, according to Daniel 9, was intended for whom? For Israel. For for the completion of God's program with Israel. So again, just by way of indication, when we look at every single text on what the tribulation is, who it's for, and what is its purpose, none of those things intersect with the stated purposes of God for the church, and the church is not found in any of those texts. The stated purposes for that time period are for the unrepentant world who did not believe the gospel, and for unrepentant Israel, whom God will bring to saving faith in Messiah Jesus. And then a final purpose of the tribulation is simply that the Lord will have his day. The Lord will have his day. Meaning the the, the day of the Lord is, is that unmistakable, manifest work of God Almighty where the world stops ignoring him. They will not be able to ignore him anymore. You know what Ecclesiastes 11 says? What does it say? It was, on, it was on the tip of my tongue when I wrote my notes, and I thought, I don't need to write that in there. Um, the hearts of men are given to do evil because the penalty is not brought about immediately. And, and you know this as a kid. If you don't get disciplined right away by your parents, you're like, hey, I guess I can get away with that one. And you get away with more and more and more and more. And that is the world around us. People wonder, uh, if God really exists and he's powerful, and he's good. Why is there all this evil in the world? Whether speaking of natural catastrophes or moral calamities. Have you heard that argument? We all recognize that moral catastrophes and natural disasters exist. We all have categories for evil and bad. Every atheist is judgmental. They tell you, Quit cramming that God stuff down my throat. People try to tell each other what to do all the time. Everybody has categories of right and wrong. And people make the complaint, well, evil exists, everybody knows that. So, God can't exist. Or, he can't be good, or he's weak. Have you heard that argument? What if God exists, he is all-powerful, he is good, and evil exists? Is that a possibility? Well, of course it is. God is just patient. God is long-suffering with sinful, rebellious mankind while man has his day. But make no mistake, friends, the Lord will have his day. The Lord's lack of immediate punishment of crimes now is no statement to his non-existence or his powerlessness or his failure to be good. It just means that God is patient with us. And don't forget the fact that God letting you get away with stuff 
and careening into greater darkness and greater rebellion is itself a judgment from God. That's clear in Romans 1. Romans 1.18 says the wrath of God is being revealed against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, and so God gives them over to a depraved mind. God gives them over to ignorance. God gives them over to the things which ought not be done. That is itself a judgment, but all of God's final judgment is being held back by his mercy. This is the argument of Romans 2. Every time a sinner sins, it's like you're throwing more water behind a great dam, and one day the dam of God's mercy will burst, and all of that wrath will come out. We are storing up wrath against ourselves for the day of God's wrath as a race on God's earth. That is what humanity is doing, and God's time will be up, God's mercy will run out, and the Lord will have his day. The world will no longer be able to ignore him. All the philosophical arguments about theodicy, well, evil exists, so God can't, all that will go away in a second when God himself shows up and holds every man accountable for their own personal evil. So one of the great purposes of the tribulation period is for the Lord to have his day. That leads to a fourth indication. And that fourth indication for us related to the rapture is simply the biblical theology of the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Uh, this is a massive topic in our Bibles. Uh, we will not cover it this morning. We'll lightly just skip rocks across the surface of it. Uh, I, will, I am planning at this point to do a sermon or a sermon series, mini-series, between Revelation 5 and 6. And I looked at the calendar this week. That puts us somewhere like uh, middle of July. Um, and, and the reason we'll do it there is because um, the Revelation 6 through 18 and then 19 and 20, all detail significant aspects of the day of the Lord. And so just before we walk into that in the book of Revelation in our main service study, uh, we'll take some time to back up and look at the day of the Lord. But I will summarize it this way. The day of the Lord in the Old Testament speaks of the establishment of God's rule on the earth and the eviction of his enemies. He will come, he will judge his enemies, he will remove sinful, rebellious man from his place on the earth, he will evict the usurpers, the squatters, the interlopers, and God himself will reign on the earth. That is what is meant by the day of the Lord. Listen to the testimony of Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 12. It is right, by the way, for God to have his day. And to have his day on the earth in the presence of his enemies. Listen, for Yahweh of hosts will have a day of reckoning against everyone who is proud and lofty and against everyone who is lifted up that he may be abased. Listen to Isaiah 4, verses 13 and 14. There is no 4, 13 and 14. I don't know what I was looking for there. I'll have to come back to that. You have to wait for the sermon series. Find out what I was thinking there. I want to say briefly that the day of the Lord can be thought of in a broad sense, biblically, and in a narrow sense. In a broad sense, uh, the, the day is longer than a 24-hour period, and in a narrow sense, it boils down to one event. We see this with the use of the word day, for instance, in Genesis 1.5, uh, evening and morning was called day. That's a 24-hour period. And then in the same verse, he called the light period of that 24-hour period day, as in daytime. And the same word day could be used to describe the broad sense 24-hour period and the narrow sense, the light time part of it. There's something similar going on with the 70th week of Daniel and the millennial kingdom. Uh, that is, there's a, there's a broad day, and you see this in the first chart here. The broad day of the Lord covers Daniel's 70th week, that's the tribulation period, and the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth. And many passages speak to both of these things as the day of the Lord, the day when God reigns on the earth, the day when God arrives, the day when God troubles Jacob. All of these things are described in the Old Testament as the day of the Lord. And in phase one, you have darkness and judgment and God's wrath. And in phase two, you have light. And you have God's blessing. And you have God's presence. 
How can you have a day of the Lord that is characterized both by dark and light, both by wrath and blessing, and by judgment and vindication, and God's delightful presence and peace on the earth? All of these things are described in the Old Testament under the banner of the day of the Lord. So we don't think of it as one moment in time when we speak of the broad day of the Lord. Second chart indicates the narrow sense of the day of the Lord. The broad day of the Lord is that whole period from the tribulation era all the way through the millennial kingdom, and the narrow day of the Lord, marked with a red arrow there, is the great and terrible day of the Lord, which is what is described when Messiah comes to the earth, Jesus with his holy angels, and wages war against his enemies. Now, we'll, again, we'll get into this more when we uh, begin our study of the day of the Lord in our Revelation series. Uh, listen to Joel 2.31 about the narrow day. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of Yahweh comes. In fact, Joel 3 and Zechariah 14, uh, both of those describe the day of the Lord and both of them describe the period after the nation's armies have gathered around Jerusalem, which is after the sixth bowl judgment in Revelation 16. They are describing there the climax of the judgment portion of the day of the Lord when Christ will come personally to the earth to lay waste to his enemies. This will end man's day and it will end the rule of Satan on the earth. The day of rebellious mankind will be over and Satan will be bound for a thousand years. The glorious reign of Messiah on earth will begin. That's the narrow day of the Lord, the great and terrible day of the Lord. What is the importance of this for the timing of the rapture? This is a little bit technical involved and it involves some of the technical arguments for some of the other views. But Malachi 4.5 uses the exact same phrase, the great and terrible day of the Lord, regarding Elijah's coming and says, Elijah will come prior to the great and terrible day of the Lord. It means that the prophetic ministry of this Elijah figure will precede Jesus' physical return to the earth in Revelation 19, but will happen during the tribulation period, which is called the broad day of the Lord. So it's not an inconsistency for Malachi to say the Elijah figure comes before the day of the Lord because he actually technically uses the phrase the great and terrible day of the Lord, which is the narrow sense day of the Lord of Messiah's return to the earth. Okay, if you followed that, great. If you didn't, it doesn't matter. We'll keep going. Uh, second implication is for 1 Thessalonians 5. Uh, maybe a little closer to home. In 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul introduces a new subject from what he had just been talking about in the rapture in chapter 4. The day of the Lord in its broad sense will, re will include the return of Christ to the earth. And as we looked at last week, it's related to the rapture, but not the same identical events. They're connected to each other, but the rapture is different than the day of the Lord. In other words, the rapture is not in the day of the Lord. That's what's significant for 1 Thessalonians 5. And when you get a biblical theology of the day of the Lord from the Old Testament, look at every passage that deals with the day of the Lord, broad sense, narrow sense. <clears throat> that helps make sense of 1 Thessalonians 5 when you see the relationship of the rapture to the day of the Lord. That becomes important in that passage. And a final implication of that is for 2 Thessalonians 2.2, 2, uh, which also makes the case that the day of the Lord is not the same thing as the rapture. All right, we're going to keep moving. Let's look at some consistencies. This is the next part of our roadmap. Some consistencies. And what I mean here is these are just observations we make in the text of Scripture that... No, by themselves, none of them prove a pre-tribulational rapture, but they do go along with everything we've been saying up to this point. And, and it's an interesting observation. As I've been working through the book of Revelation in the Greek text, <clears throat> it is very Hebrew-ish. Uh, the, the grammat grammaticists, grammat grammat grammatarians, uh, grammar people, they talk about Hebraisms in the book of Revelation. And it's interesting, you can make a comparison between all of John's writings. John was a blue-collar guy. He was a fisherman and a disciple of Jesus. Uh, he amazed the religious leaders in his day that he was this unlearned fisherman guy from the wrong side of the tracks, and how did he know so much Scripture? Well, he'd been with Jesus. And when you read the Gospel of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, the letters of John, they are very... 
colloquial New Testament era Greek. When you read the book of Revelation, same author. A lot of people criticize the book of Revelation from a Greek perspective and they say, John's got really bad grammar. What happened to him? Uh, you know, all, all these years after walking with Christ, he forgot how to speak Greek. Really? <laughs> I don't think that's what's going on. You can trace John's, they, they're called solacisms, bad grammar statements. You can trace all of those to Hebrew roots, either allusions and quotations of Old Testament texts or Hebrew ways of saying things, turns of phrases. What does that mean? It means the book of Revelation in its flavor, even down at the detailed grammatical level and the way things are stated, is very Old Testament. The book of Revelation is a continuation of the Old Testament prophets. In the book of Revelation, John the Revelator is an Old Testament prophet, picking up the pieces of all those not yet fulfilled promises about Messiah that didn't come to, to fruition in his first coming, but will come to fruition in his second coming. Even seeing the book of Revelation down at the grammatical level is another indication that Revelation just picks up where Daniel left off. Revelation just picks up where Zechariah left off. Revelation just affirms what Isaiah said. There, there's nothing when, the, when Christ came and you come to the New Testament that erases all those Old Testament promises. The book of Revelation, in fact, takes them at face value. Just as we took first coming promises of Messiah at face value, we take second coming promises of Messiah from the Old Testament at face value. The very language and grammar of the book of Revelation agrees with this. Uh, that has to do not only with the, the, the Hebraic uh, grammar, but also the vocabulary, the titles of God that are used. Overwhelmingly, these are not uh, New Testament language features, but Old Testament ones. A second consistency is just in the book of Revelation, you have some 600 to 1,000 Old Testament allusions or references. And I say 600 to 1,000, you're like, that's a big gap. Didn't somebody just count them? Yes, everybody counts them and they count them differently. Are these two words, is that a reference to this verse? Or if this verse in Revelation quotes Isaiah, but Isaiah is quoting somebody else, how many does that count for? And so I don't know how to get the right number. Um, but probably the most exhaustive treatment of Old Testament allusions in the New Testament puts the number at over 1,000. And, and I think that's probably closer to accurate. What's staggering about that is the book of Revelation does not quote the epistles. It doesn't quote church era documents. It doesn't quote the New Testament. Over a thousand times it quotes what? The Old Testament. This picks up where God left off with Israel. And, and who are the people we find again in that tribulation period? It, it, from chapter four on all the way through chapter 19, Israel, 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 and the unrepentant nations. Not the church. Again, not a proof text, but, but a consistency. And then I would put before you some interesting textual chronologies. And go ahead and look at Mark 13. It's one of several examples to look at. And by textual chronologies, I just mean, huh, it's interesting the order of events that are described in these texts. Church age, tribulation period, return of Christ, and glory. Millennial kingdom into eternal state. Mark 13 is a good example of that. Uh, you have the apostolic age in verses 1 to 4. And, and I'll just reference these to them. You can write them down. You can trace this out at a later time. From 5 and following, you have the gospel age, the church age, and somewhere in there, maybe verse 9, maybe verse 13, kind of depends on how you take some of the details, but clearly when you get to verse 14, when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, let the reader understand, right? He quotes Daniel um, and bringing us back to the, the theology of the Antichrist. By that time, you're definitely in the tribulation age. And then in verse 24, you are in the kingdom age. In those days, after that tribulation, etc., um, and, and so just the, the, um, the, the chronology of the events there in Mark 13 follows the very chronology we've been talking about. A church era, a tribulation era, and a kingdom era. 
Uh, the same thing could be found in Matthew 24. Uh, it can also interestingly be found in Isaiah 24 and 25. And I don't mean the church is in the Old Testament. The, the church was a mystery from an Old Testament perspective. But in Isaiah 24 and 25, you have the same pattern of tribulation of Israel followed by kingdom and world peace for Israel and for the nations. So uh, again, that's just a... a um, Another indication is those chronological consistencies throughout the Bible. All right, eighth waypoint here on our roadmap is just other considerations. Isn't that a nice catch-all? We can just talk about anything under this heading. I'll just give you one for now. <clears throat> Let's pull up the, the next chart. I'm going to put the post-trib chart on the screen. And... I want to present a, a difficulty for post-tribulationalism that I believe is, is unanswered. And the issue here relates to the population of the millennial kingdom. And, and this becomes important because not only in your uh, kingdom passages in the Old Testament but also in the chronology of Revelation 20, it becomes clear that you have mortality in the millennial kingdom. And while the curse is backed way up, the, the effects of the curse are, are greatly ameliorated during Christ's reign on the earth. They are not altogether gone. In fact, it's not until the eternal state, Revelation 21 and 22, until there is no more curse, there is no more mourning, no more dying. In fact, the, the prophet Isaiah says, if someone lives to 100 years, he'll be considered a babe. What does that mean? Well, there, there's mortality. Psalm 2 talks about Christ reigning on the earth on the throne of David and ruling the nations with a rod of iron. In other words, there will be discipline and a criminal justice system with Jesus at the head during the millennial kingdom. There will be sin. There will be death. Although this will be the best era humanity has ever experienced. Far less sin, far less death than the world has known since the extrication from the Garden of Eden. It will be the most marvelous time in world history with Jesus on the throne. And yet, there will still be mortality. The other reason we know there's still sin, look at Revelation chapter 20. <clears throat> Six times you have the phrase, a thousand years, right? Satan is bound for a thousand years, verse two. He won't be able to deceive the nations any longer for a thousand years, verse three. Then in verse four, uh, the, the tribulation martyrs who didn't take the mark of the beast come to life. They reign with Christ for a thousand years. Verse 5, the rest of the dead did not come to life till the thousand years were done. And blessed is holy is he who has a part in the first resurrection. They will reign with Christ for a thousand years. Verse 6, and then finally, when the thousand years are completed, verse 7, Satan will be released from his prison. He will come out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth. They come upon the, upon the broad plain of the earth, surround the camp of the saints, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And then Satan is thrown into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet were thrown a thousand years prior. What does that mean? During the thousand year period, Satan's locked up. Think about the three enemies of the Christian from the Westminster Confession, the world, the flesh, the devil. Right? The world culture is Jesus culture. Satan's locked up. The, the, the God of this world who roams the earth right now seeking whom he may devour. He's before the throne of God making accusation before the, uh, about the brethren before God. Um, he infiltrates the church, 1 Timothy 5. He's involved in the women's ministry in Ephesus. I mean, Satan is active and involved now. Then he will be locked up. Uh, of the three enemies, the, the world and Satan are taken care of. What's left? The human heart. How wicked is the human heart, by the way, if in the perfect environment, at the beginning of the millennial kingdom, everybody's a believer, the, the mortals who populate the millennial, ki millennial kingdom have children. They inherit a sin nature. They'll sin. They'll need discipline. Satan's locked up. The, the world bows the knee to Christ, and yet the human heart is still an enemy. So much so that when the thousand years are completed, during the best era the human history has ever known, and the people born in it will never know anything different, they'll look back at our period like, wait, you lived during the dark times? What was that called? The church age or something like that? It's kind of the way we look back at the antediluvian period. What was life like before the flood? Always curious about that. They'll be curious about our era. And the world will be so good, so prosperous, so plentiful, so peaceful under the reign of Christ 
and a world bowed to his ways. And yet the human heart, so wicked, will still follow Satan in the end so that numerous people (laughs) will root for the underdog and rebel against Christ. I just went off on a depravity mini-sermon. Sorry about that. Um, The the problem with post-millennialism is there's nobody to populate the millennial kingdom if at the end of the tribulation of the return of Christ, every believer is glorified in a rapture and returns to the earth to reign. In other words, nobody's mortal. That's a problem that I believe post-tribulationalism can't answer. So... Anyway, post-tribulationalism may be the the most popular view in Reformed circles who talk about the rapture. Um, That's that's just another consideration to put in the the hopper there. All right, uh, last section we'll look at is just some questions. And I've I've received a number of questions from you uh, via text, via email. Uh, I I regret I can't give these all the time that they need. Um, The first question is about missions. And the quote from Matthew 24, 14 is very simple and straightforward. It just says, this gospel of the kingdom shall be proclaimed to all the earth and then the end shall come. And and many have made the argument that you can't believe in a pre-tribulational rapture, that Jesus can come back at any time if missions isn't done because the church can't leave until missions is finished, according to Matthew 24, 14. Does that stand? I want to remind you that Matthew 24 is actually a tribulation passage filled with all the instructions about what tribulation saints need to be doing during the tribulation. And in the book of Revelation, in 6 through 18, multiple times the gospel goes to every tongue and tribe and nation and people. Now, I don't believe this gets the church off the hook. We ought to go to the nations. We ought to take the gospel to every tongue, tribe, nation, and people. We must. That is our commission. But Jesus' imminent return is not dependent on missions. And that argument has been foisted in mission circles, and maybe it's just me in the circles I've been in, but you can't believe in a pre-trib rapture if you love missions. No, that's not actually what the text says. All right, next question. I I know this is fast. I'm so sorry. Can pre-tribulationalism be the right view since it is so complicated? Look, you have charts, there's red arrows, there's U-turns, there's blue things. I mean, what is all that? I mean, can't it just be Jesus comes and it's over? I think many are attracted to a two-age model for its simplicity. I mean, who wants to believe in a bunch of convoluted stuff you need charts for? (laughs) And I I would just say, (sighs) sure, I guess. Um, There are lots of things that are complicated. How, How did Jesus finish the work of atonement for me at the cross two millennia ago, and yet I was at enmity with God for my earthly life. There's a time travel problem there somewhere, right? I mean, what does it mean that that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life from the foundation of the world, and yet in time I was a sinner and a rebel and, and not in a love relationship with God, and then at one point rescued and I mean, it just takes a lot of work to put all the scriptures together to understand the atonement, which is just central to everything we love. The Trinity, similarly. It it takes a lot of understanding of a lot of different passages. Just take the doctrine of the resurrection. Who raised Jesus from the dead? According to the Bible, God did. Who raised Jesus from the dead? The Holy Spirit did. Who raised Jesus from the dead? I lay down my life, I take it up, nobody takes it from me. Jesus raised himself from the dead. Trinity, well, it took three passages to get there. It's complicated. That doesn't mean it's not true. All right, number three. Isn't pre-tribulationalism dispensationalism? And we all know that's a bad word. I mean, who wants to be a dispensationalist with with all of its boogeymen? And if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. For for some people in some circles, dispensationalism is this bad word. We're we're just taught to not like it, think it's silly, be afraid of it, uh, or whatever. I don't really care about the label. In fact, if you read Calvin's Institutes, you will find the word dispensation more than any Charles Ryrie textbook. It just means an economy of God's working with his people in different times, in different eras, in different ways. God's not working with us now in the same way that he worked with people before the flood, nor with Adam and Eve in the garden, nor under Mosaic law, and God's free to do that. Theologians throughout history have recognized the different ways in which God has worked 
things out. Now, dispensationalism as a theological label comes with much baggage, and I prefer not to use it. Some of the baggage that, that comes with popular dispensationalism would be things like anti-lordship, uh, the belief that you can have Jesus as your Savior but never submit to him as Lord, separating out the person and work of Christ, or Arminianism, or Charismania, or, uh, well, isn't pre-tribulationalism, isn't that the view of Trinity Broadcasting Network, the, the TBN crazy guys that are always asking for your money? Um, any overlap with error doesn't make truth wrong. What makes, it, what makes error error is if it's not in the Bible. And, and so sometimes the, 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 the doctrine itself of a pre-tribulational rapture gets lumped into all kinds of other things. And I want you to know I have a, a whole collection of bad books in my office that are of this ilk, date setters. People that, that said, hey, we're, we're going to tell you exactly what time on what day and what year Jesus is going to come back. Guess what all those dates, times, and years are in the past already? <laughs> they were wrong. I have a whole bunch of books like that. I, I, have a, I have a series of books on my shelf. Every time there's a new war in the Middle East, somebody writes a book. It's like, oh, this is one of the signs. It's coming. It's near. Everybody buy my book. <sighs> That's not helpful. And, and then there are the, the fictionalizers, the scare tactics. Uh, all of these things um, may be designed to draw attention to a theologian more than elucidate a biblical doctrine. And, and that's tragic. A, a belief in a true doctrine does not associate you with the guilt of those who have said error. And, and I think that's a, an unfortunate connection. Uh, the next question, isn't the pre-tribulational view a symptom of Christian escapism. Well, Christians just want to get out of suffering. Uh, I want to just turn your attention to 1 Thessalonians 3 real briefly. 1 Thessalonians 3, Paul, in his pastoral heart for the Thessalonian believers, he, he says, we could endure it no longer. We sent Timothy, our brother, to strengthen and encourage your faith. Verse three, so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions, uh, tribulation. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. We, we kept telling you advance of this, that we were going to suffer affliction, and so it came to pass, and you know. What is Paul saying to the Thessalonian believers? The Christian life is marked, marked by affliction, tribulation, trouble. This is really important for us to understand. Right now, Christians get trouble from the world. During the tribulation, the world will get trouble from God. Now, the argument that Christians should expect suffering is right. It's biblical. But that has nothing to do with the tribulation period that God has designed for the world and for Israel. That period is God's pent-up judgment against the unrepentant nations and God's purification and preparation for Israel to have new hearts in his kingdom. Christians don't escape tribulations, even if we are not destined to participate in the tribulation coming on the world. All right, next question. Uh, aren't the rapture movies silly? Y yeah. <laughs> I'll just speak boldly if I can. And, and this is really preferential on my, my heart. You're just going to hear my personality coming out. I don't like Christian fiction. I don't mean Christians who write fiction novels. That's one thing. But when Christians fictionalize biblical accounts, I, I, this is just me. Okay, I'm just going to bleed on you a little bit. Anytime uh, somebody has to write a script for how the story goes and the biblical narrative doesn't say all the details they want to say, what do they do? They fill in the details. Anytime somebody gets an actor to play a biblical character, it's interpretive. And do you know what? It's never right. It is never right. It is not infallible. It is not an error. I'm going to get off my hobby horse. I just don't like it. I'm going to stay on my hobby horse for another second. The rapture movies fill in the blanks. The rapture novels, they fill in the blanks. I think they can cast a bad light on a good doctrine. That is not where you get your information. You get your information from the Bible. Don't judge the doctrine by its fictionalized representations. All right, uh, isn't pre-tribulationalism new? How can it be right? Uh, no, it's old if it's in the Bible, bottom line. 
Think about the Reformation period. What were the reformers doing? They, they were pulling the church, the true church, out from the muck and mire of medieval Catholicism. What were they fighting for? Sola Scriptura. We're going to get our answers from the Bible, not the Roman Catholic magisterium and authority, so-called. Uh, sola, whatever the other solas are, you know what they are. Grace, glory of God, faith alone. Uh, all these things are, are critical. They were fighting for, with their very lives. They shed blood over these doctrines. It shouldn't be surprising to us they did not get around to eschatology. You know, John Calvin wrote a commentary on every book of the Bible except Revelation. Shouldn't surprise us. Praise God, we stand on the shoulders of the reformers and can see clearly because they gave us the Bible again. Um, if doctrines were lost and then rediscovered, it doesn't make a doctrine new. certainly doesn't make it wrong. By the way, the first three centuries were pre-millennialists. You, you can go back and listen to the, the introduction of the book of Revelation when we talked about this. They were called Kiliasts. Kilius from the Greek word for a thousand. Uh, they believed in a literal reign of Christ on the earth for a thousand years. In fact, they also believed that the, the era of mankind might just be about a 7,000 year period. 2,000 years from Genesis to Abraham, 2,000 years from Abraham to Jesus, 2,000 years from Jesus to the return of Jesus, followed by a thousand year or a Sabbath millennium, 7,000 years. Now, that's not a biblical argument, that was their supposition. It hasn't yet been proven wrong. It's just interesting. They believed that the Lord would have his Sabbath rest in a final seventh millennium after man has his six. That was the doctrine of the first three centuries. This isn't new, it just got lost. It got recovered. And you can find traces of premillennial doctrine uh, long before popularization of um, dispensationalism or something like that. By the way, uh, Irenaeus... Um, gave detailed accounts of the Antichrist, the 70th week of Daniel, and its relationship to the book of Revelation. You know who Irenaeus was? He was a disciple of Polycarp. You know who Polycarp was? A disciple of the Apostle John. That's very early witness to these doctrines. All right, what is the relationship of uh, the rapture and the two resurrections in Revelation chapter 20? I read it briefly earlier. You have the first resurrection and the second resurrection. Notice the resurrection that is in view in verse four. Verse four describes the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and the word of God. They had not worshiped the beast or his image. They had not received the mark on their forehead and their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. It's a specific revelation. It's a uh, resurrection. It's a resurrection of tribulation martyrs during the time of the Antichrist, who were killed and did not take the mark of the beast. That's a specific re resurrection. And it is called here their participation in the first resurrection, and the rest of the dead don't come to life till the second resurrection, and those who participate in the first one don't participate in the second death. Second resurrection is a resurrection to new life that takes you right to the great white throne judgment and the judgment of being thrown into the lake of fire. What does all of that mean? This is in accord with Daniel 12 describing two kinds of resurrection, one unto life, one, under ju one unto judgment. The first and second res resurrections in Revelation 20 are two kinds of resurrection. Not that there are only two resurrections that ever happen. And we know there are not only two resurrections that ever happened because Jesus Christ, who is of the first kind, has already been raised in this way. And as we've been talking about the resurrection rapture event, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, um, those precede the martyrs who died during the tribulation and their resurrection. There are multiple resurrection events in the Bible, but only two kinds of resurrection. All right, uh, does the whole church get raptured or just the faithful part? The whole church gets raptured, uh, number eight. Okay, number nine, were the apostles wrong to believe that Jesus could return during their lifetimes? Uh, we talked about the doctrine of imminency. Um, if Paul believed Jesus could come back in his own lifetime, does that wrong? Uh, was he wrong? Does that shred his cred as an apostle? 
Uh, is he over? <laughs> Uh, you need to understand something about apostleship. Apostleship did not mean you were infallible as a human. It just meant that when you composed God's word, you did so without error. But Paul was a human and he was wrong about a lot of things, but I don't think this belief meant that Paul was wrong. It's not wrong to believe Jesus could return during your lifetime because he could. That's not an error. It certainly is not an error to have your hope in that and confidence in in that. Paul was not wrong to believe that Jesus could return during his lifetime. All right, one last question. Is the last trumpet of 1 Corinthians 15, 52 equal to the seventh trumpet of Revelation eleven fifteen? And if so, that would mean the rapture happens at the seventh trumpet somewhere in the middle of the tribulation. Doesn't that prove a, a mid-trib or a pre-wrath rapture view? And the answer to that is no, <clears throat> and I'll give you a, a number of reasons here. There is nothing in Revelation 11, 15 to 19, where that seventh trumpet happens, nothing in there about the rapture, about the church, and no correlation to any of the rapture or church passages. Secondly, Revelation was, written, was not written before 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians written in 55 AD, Revelation written in 95 AD, 40 years difference. Paul wasn't looking at Revelation 11 when he wrote 1 Corinthians 15. Revelation 11's language of the seventh trumpet judgment was not in the vocabulary of anybody when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 15 and described the rapture at the last trumpet. So it's difficult to make those a technical term when you have two different authors spread out by 40 years and Paul is, Paul is not even familiar with the phrase. <clears throat> Thirdly, fourthly, I don't know where I'm at. Next, all of the other observations about the purposes of the tribulation and the participants of the tribulation still stand. In other words, uh, you, you can't overrule why God states he's bringing the tribulation and for whom it's for um, by arguing from identical trumpets. Revelation 11 does not depict the very last trumpet that will ever sound. To say that Revelation 11, uh, the seventh trumpet, is the last trumpet ever and therefore correlates with the 1 Corinthians 15, last trumpet, implies that there will be no trumpets ever after that period. And, and we know that's false. From Matthew 24, Jesus will descend with his holy angels at the sound of a trumpet. And in the millennial kingdom, according to Zechariah, there will be trumpets at the Feast of Tabernacles. So there are still trumpets yet in the future. The last trumpet of 1 Corinthians 15 is not the last trumpet that will ever sound. What you do have to account for is why would Paul call the rapture resurrection event in 1 Corinthians 15 and the announcement of it the last trumpet. I want to give you a category for that and it comes from the Roman military and the issuing of last trumpet blasts. And this is something like last call or last bell. Last bell at school means, okay, you, you get out of school and you get to go home. There's going to be another one tomorrow. Right? Last call. If somebody says, last call for seconds, um, I hope that doesn't mean this is the last time for all of eternity future I get to refill my dinner plate. Right? Did you get last call on mashed potatoes? Yes, I do that every night. <laughs> There's a bunch of last calls. Uh, what's the idea of a last trumpet? Well, it's interesting in the, the Roman military, a first trumpet it was the trumpet for assembly of the troops. And interestingly, Paul used that very concept in 1 Corinthians 14, one chapter earlier. 1 Corinthians 14, 8, he says, if the trumpet does not give a definite signal, the troops will not prepare for battle. In the very next chapter, he talks about the last trumpet, which is the signal to call the troops home. Listen, that's a fitting metaphor for the church, isn't it? At the last trumpet, oh, Christians, your battle is over. I'm calling you home. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this study. Thank you for the truth of your return for your people. We pray that our lives would be in accord with that anticipation, that we would be belted in readiness, faithful in service, fervently evangelistic, taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, obedient when you come. And Lord, may it be the heartbeat of our anticipation to say, Lord Jesus, come quickly. And we ask it in your name. Amen.